Um, so, so the the session that we're running today, um, just going to be an hour long. We're going to be focusing on engaging audiences digitally during lockdown. Uh, so, I'm going to be highlighting some really good examples of content that's been created uh, by museums or heritage organisations uh, during the first lockdown, and then one or two examples uh, from more recently, which I think are still good examples to share. And um, the idea is that hopefully this will give you some inspiration and ideas uh, for the stuff that you're doing uh, during this lockdown whilst museums have to remain closed. And then also going forward, um, whilst you uh, potentially have to remain closed further. Sorry, I'm getting some feedback from somebody. So I'm just going to quickly mute everyone. Okay, I think that's sorted. Cool. Okay, so before we get started in uh, with all of the great examples we've got to share, uh, the main thing that I wanted to um, say is think strategically about what you're doing. So obviously, we're going to be going through lots of really great examples um, from museums that are doing all sorts of interesting things with their content and their audiences. Um, but just because this thing worked for that museum doesn't mean that it will work for you. So when you're thinking about the types of content that you're creating, you want to be thinking strategically. So you want to be thinking about how uh, the activity um, will help your organization achieve its uh, mission and its aims. You want to be thinking um, why the platform that you're choosing for this activity, be it social media or your website, um, is the appropriate activity, uh, appropriate platform for that activity. Uh, you want to be thinking about uh, why does it have to be digital? You know, this thing that you're doing, does it need to be digital? Um, could it have elements of digital and uh, some elements that aren't necessarily? I know at the moment this isn't necessarily an option, um, but going forward, you know, that might be something you want to be thinking about. And then um, uh, lastly, you know, who are you trying to engage with this activity, with this piece of content? You know, who, who is it for? Who is your audience? And the more that you can think about these types of things, the more strategic you can be uh, with the, the content that you're putting out there. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. Um, but what I am going to do is share uh, these this list of resources. Don't feel that you need to take copious notes because um, I'll be sharing the presentation at the end of the session. Uh, so you can check out all of those links. Um, the ACE DCN's introduction, ACE DCN introduction to digital strategy is a really good one. And um, it's quite nice and short and it gives you a, a good flavor of you know the sorts of things you might want to be thinking about. And then uh, the COGAP guide to digital strategy is much more, um, you know, it, it's much larger and it's much more in depth. Um, and it's a really good place to start if you're thinking about uh, using digitally more strategically. So that's that. Um, let's get started with examples. So first off, we're going to be looking at some examples of digital exhibitions on various different platforms. So an example that I wanted to start off showing is uh, the Museum of London's um, Tweetside Hoard. So I really like this example because basically in 2014, uh, the Museum of London had a um, exhibition called the Cheapside Hoard. Some of you might have seen it. Um, and then obviously that exhibition closed uh, because it was just a temporary exhibition. They do have plans for having this exhibition in the new museum um, when, when that comes to pass. Um, but what they did for now was just create a really simple but effective Twitter thread. Um, called the tweet side hoard, um, basically just reusing all of the content that they had from that past exhibition. So things like um, the images and some of the you know, exhibition panel information, they they took all of that content and then they repurposed it for um, for a Twitter audience, and it was really effective. And it was a really sort of simple uh, way to to reuse that uh, that content and engage a new audience with an exhibition that that has passed. So I really like that example. Another example from a smaller organization, the Cartoon Museum. Um, they uh, recently, as part of uh, hashtag Museum Passion, which was a BBC event, um, they used a 360 Google tour uh, to give a 360 tour of um, their exhibition. So just for that one day, uh, you could click on the link, go to the 360 tour, um, it let you spin around the exhibition and you could click on the different pictures to get information and you could see the image in more detail. Again, this was just like a really nice, simple way 
of um, creating further engagement with an exhibition that uh, due to, to lockdown and, and due to, you know, limited visitor numbers, they weren't able to get as many people in as, as, um, as they'd like. The, they use the Google Tour Creator for that, and it's a really simple um, app, and we've actually got a tutorial for it. So at the end of this section of slides, there'll be a, a resource link there. So I thought that was a really nice example of how you could um, you know, use free apps to, to create a different experience around your exhibitions. Something a little bit more expensive um, is uh, the exhibition from the Migration Museum, Heart of the Nation. Um, so this is something that they would have had to get web developers in to create. And I thought it'd be a nice example to share um, of something that's, you know, slightly more expensive, maybe something that you might need to look at project funding uh, to do, but not necessarily something that you can't do um, if, if you don't, you know, if, if, if you fancy giving it a go. Um, so, so Heart of the Nation, it's a really nice online exhibition, um, quite light touch with lots of really nice animations and it's a really sort of easy experience to just sort of um, go through online. The uh, thing that I will say about the Migration Museum is that it's an organisation that hasn't had a permanent home. Um, I think they might do now, but, but historically they, they hadn't had like a permanent physical um, museum space. So you can learn a lot from those sorts of organisations at the moment uh, when it comes to digital because they've been using digital. <laughs> As either an air raid siren or somebody's uh, Hoover. <laughs> I'm hoping for Hoover. Um, sorry, so the, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of organisations out there who have been doing digital for, you know, the majority of their existence and organizations like the migration museum they're they're very much good examples of how you can effectively you know run a heritage um experience that either predominantly or partly relies on on a digital um a digital experience a digital digital platform for for engaging their audiences so another nice um sort of slightly cheaper example of an online exhibition is um, this from the Palace of Westminster for um, hashtag we Westminster 150, uh, which is 150 years of, of Westminster. Uh, they, they created a, um, an online exhibition, mostly just using artworks um, through the Art UK Curate platform. So this is a really good platform that can be used for organizations that don't necessarily have, you know, a, a strong web presence where you could create these sorts of uh, experiences on your own website without significant redevelopment uh, and significant funding. And um, so Art UK, they've launched this curate platform where you can create your own curated um, exhibitions uh, using images and text. And it's something that's free to use and, and anyone can use it. And then once you've created it, you can share it, you know, via a link on your website or you can share it through social media. And this is a really nice example of how you can use it quite effectively, particularly if you've got like a specific um, event or a specific uh, anniversary that you wanted to um, celebrate um, using this platform. So definitely one worth checking out. And then here's the list of resources that I promised. So we've got the 360 Google Tour Creator. So you could create a 360 tour of an exhibition, um, similar to one that the uh, Cartoon Museum created. All you need for that is the Google Tour Creator web platform and the um, Google, uh, what is it, Google Street View app, so that you can make a 360 image. We've got a Museum Interactive Creator if you wanted to create some sort of like interactive museum experience, um, exhibition experience. We've got that link there. Um, and then yeah, loads of other links for doing various different things um, that you might like to try when it comes to online exhibitions um, around your content. So that was a whistle stop tour of some um, online exhibition examples. Next up, we've got some social media engagement examples. So I really like this example from um, the Culture Perth and Kim Ross Museum. It's called Dougie Draws, and uh, at the start of lockdown, uh, the, the first lockdown, their events officer, Dougie, uh, was obviously not able to do his usual work because you know, nowhere could really have events, um, but it turned out that Dougie is actually very talented at using Microsoft Paint. 
so they um, started this series called Dougie Draws, where um, Dougie would take uh, collection images um, from their archive and then uh, draw a version of it in paint. And um, it was really effective. And I thought it was a really nice way of utilizing skills for members of staff that, you know, you might not necessarily know that they have, or you might be aware that they have, but can't, you know, really think of how you could work it in. Um, I thought this was a really nice example. And potentially one that you could, you know, it, it shows that you can create really sort of engaging and interesting, unique social media content if you think a little bit outside of the box. Next up, we've got um, the, the Cooper Gallery. And they've been making uh, museum jigsaws, which again, they started during lockdown, um, but have continued doing since. Um, and it's actually really easy to, to do it, um, but it's something that I'd not seen before. Um, and it was a really use, a really nice uh, use of the um, uh, platform. I think it's called Jigsaw Planet. And you basically just uh, put in any image into Jigsaw Planet, and then it will create a jigsaw out of that image. And you can then share the link so that people can, you know, complete the jigsaw uh, from home. And uh, they've also got sort of like a, a timer, so you can start the timer when you start completing the jigsaw, and then you can stop the timer once you've finished completing it. And uh, they've created, they've got like leaderboards for each um, for each different puzzle. So I think it's just again a really nice way of reusing content that's already there that they already have because these are all you know digitized archive images and um, just reusing it in interesting and, and creative ways. Another really nice hashtag that um, was started uh, during lockdown is hashtag lie to me from York Castle Museum. Um, I really like this hashtag because it's uh, mostly because of the, the replies in the comments. So the idea is that York Castle Museum shared an object, um, an image of an object from their archives, which is a little bit obscure or, or you know, not quite sure what it might have been used for. And then they basically uh, shared it with a tweet and said, uh, you know, come up with an idea of, of what this could be. And the idea is that people were coming up with, you know, the most fantastical, weird, funny, uh, silly ideas of, of what this object could actually be. So when you click on the, the link to have a look through the thread, you can see all of the stupid and silly um, uh, comments from, from people, you know, suggesting what it is. My favorite was the, uh, the, the one on the right hand side of the screen uh, with the sort of like pitchfork on the front. I think somebody replied, I think that's the skeleton of my cat because we all know how prickly cats can be. Another um, really nice example, and this is based around the hashtag museum from home. And that's a hashtag that um, is was created by um, Dan Vo and uh, Sasha Coward. And um, it's made a bit of a resurgence because of the second lockdown. Um, but they did an excellent job of sort of encouraging museums and getting them all together to focus around this one hashtag museum from home, um, which museums were using to then share their uh, various different, you know, pieces of content that they'd created. So Leeds uh, Discovery Centre, they were doing some really good uh, examples through museum from home and um, basically just really short curator talks. Um, so uh, their, their curator just, you know, sat in front of a camera um, and I think she might have just used, you know, an iPad or it wasn't anything fancy. And she just sort of spoke to the camera and talked about, you know, one specific thing each time. And each video was, you know, around two minutes long, um, two, three minutes long. So, so it's not you know, a really lengthy piece of content, but it's something that is quite um, bite size and quite easy to digest for, uh, for an audience. And I think they might, they might have done something like 70 videos. Um, and they've got an entire, uh, I believe, YouTube playlist of, of all of the videos. So you can, you know, check through those and, and have a look. And um, yeah, they got some really good engagement, really good feedback. And it's just a really nice example of how uh, you can do something very simple, but something that's very effective. We're going to um, look at an example from Egger Museum in a second. The, um, this example from the Museum of English Rural Life. Many of you might have heard of uh, Museum of English Rural Life or Merle. They're quite well known in, you know, on Twitter in general, but definitely within the uh, heritage and museum Twitter game. Um, they 
create some really engaging, really interesting content. And uh, they are a small museum, um, but the the way that they communicate online and the the sort of audience numbers that they have would suggest that they weren't. The um, the thing that I really liked about this is that during the beginning of lockdown, um, there was a video game called Animal Crossing, which was really popular at the time. Um, and to be fair, I think it's still quite popular, but, but not quite as popular as it was in March. And um, as part of the game, uh, I could talk about Animal Crossing for ages, but for, for what they did as part of the game, the players could create their own um, sort of like outfits, costumes and dresses. And uh, one of the uh, items that you could create and edit yourself is a long sleeve dress. Um, but the Museum of English Rural Life um, said that, you know, you can use it to create your very own rural smock, um, which is something that they have examples of in their collection. Um, so they sent out this tweet, um, we'd like you, the player, to design your very own rural smock and um, dazzle us by sharing it with the hashtag animal crossing. And then um, sort of following that, they also shared loads of images from their collections of different smocks and pictures of people wearing smocks. And, um, and then subsequently, they even created like an online gallery that um, showed all of the um, submissions from people who had created their own smocks in game as well. It's just a really nice example of how you can, you know, be aware of things that are popular and things that are happening um, in the world uh, that are picking up steam in, in various different online platforms like Twitter or Reddit or, you know, wherever you want to get your information from. And, and uh, the Museum of English Rural Life did a really good job of uh, sort of blending their, their content to, to match the sorts of things that people were talking about and people were interested in. Um, so, you know, really a really good example of how they managed to make their collection items relevant uh, for, for something that was happening right, right then and there. This is the example from the um, Egger Museum that I wanted to talk about. It's a really nice example of um, how you can use the various different free, plat free platforms that are available um, in creative ways. So what they basically created was a choose your own adventure um, style game using Twitter threads. So the way it works is um, a Twitter thread, you basically post your original tweet and then underneath it, you can add another tweet and underneath that you can add another tweet and so on and so forth. I think forever, I'm not entirely sure. There, might, there may well be a limit, but um, what they did was they created a um, story based around a uh, floor of Seville and they used the um, Royal Holloway College and uh, 1887. Um, and I think this is, you know, a person who's relevant to Egham and, and relevant to um, the, the museum. And they created this sort of choose your own adventure where you were playing as Flora and you had to get from, I mean, you had to complete your day without getting in trouble um, and avoiding the principal's office. So as you play, you can see on the right hand side here, it says one of the college maids uh, wakes you at 7.30 a.m. Um, bringing you some hot water uh, for you to wash. Um, as the bell chimes, do you A, go to the chapel? And then, you know, there's option B, option C. And depending on which one you choose depends on what sort of answer you get. So I think I answered um, C, try to explore the grounds. And because I was supposed to be going to, to chapel, I got caught by the principal and sent to the principal's office. And that's where my adventure ended. So it's a really nice example of how you can uh, use these platforms you know, Twitter threads weren't designed to do this, um, but they were able to, to use it to create this experience um, for their audiences that was relevant to their collections and relevant to, to, uh, to their histories. Um, failing this, you can also slightly easier create a similar sort of choose your own adventure style activity um, using a platform called Twine, T-W-I-N-E. Lots of tutorials for Twine online. Um, but uh, but it's, it sort of works similarly, but um, it's a lot more confined and, and it looks a lot better. So if you are thinking about a choose your own adventure style, you can use Twitter threads. Um, but if you're looking for something slightly easier and slightly more sort of, um, I don't know, compact, maybe um, Twine is a really good platform to check out. And I'll um, add a link to a Twine tutorial on the slides at the end. So here's um, a load of links to resources. 
we've got um, Twitter 101, Facebook 101 for those who um, aren't entirely sure about the platforms and would like a nice introduction. Those are those are really good. And um, we've got some video ed editing tutorials and video uh, image editing tutorials. If you're thinking about creating content, uh, you know, video content, or if you want to edit some images that you might have in your collections, and um, got some training there on social media analytics. Um, and then, yeah, loads of other um, resources here, which which you might find really useful when you're thinking about creating this type of content. Going to do podcasts now, and then we're going to have a quick five minute break. Just so that I can open a window because it's very warm in this office. So podcasts. The uh, Museum of London has a really lovely podcast called um, London Lives. And this podcast is actually based around uh, their Memories of London program. Um, and uh, the Memories of London program has been designed for people with dementia um, so that they can listen to the podcast and remember aspects of their, their childhood or their lives um, through the Museum of London's collections. It's a really nice example of how you can uh, stay connected with an audience, um, which is vulnerable um, at, at the moment. You know, the majority of the, the people that they're They've created this um, this podcast for do live in care homes. So, um, so you know they're obviously very vulnerable at the moment. And uh, this is just a really nice example of how you can create content for those audiences. So definitely worth um, listening to. We've also got uh, the Museum of uh, Domestic Designs um, podcast that feels like home. And Moda actually uh, ran a training session for us last week looking at podcasting and we'll have that video up on our YouTube uh, hopefully next week um, so you can check that out. Uh, but the really interesting thing about um, Moda's podcast is that the first season, the majority of which they recorded uh, before COVID and the second season they recorded um, during lockdown and um, so they you know recorded it via teams and they did it all remotely um, online and they had special guests um, sort of you know, coming in from teams or zoom as well and, and use those platforms to record and uh, create the podcast so it just sort of goes to show that even if you're not in the same physical space as other members of your team or the people that you like to talk to um, the the teleconferencing platforms that are available to us today are, are so much better than the uh, platforms that were available to us you know four five six months ago so definitely um good tools to utilize uh, if you're thinking about creating this sort of content another egum example but another really good example is uh, the egum oddities uh, podcast i really like this podcast because it's slightly more I don't think off the wall is the right word, but because they focus around oddity collections within their uh, museum, it's a little bit more sort of tongue in cheek, it's a little bit funnier um, than uh, some of the other podcasts that uh, heritage organizations create. I'm not saying that a serious podcast or a funny podcast is better. Um, I'm just saying that there's lots of different types of audiences and lots of different types of content that you can create. Um, you know, Egham's a nice example of something that's a bit more lighthearted. Um, and this next example as well, museums and that um, is a nice example uh, from Leeds Museums and Galleries, again, of a podcast that's quite lighthearted. Um, it's quite, uh, you know, conversational. Um, and this one, they, uh, they focus actually on aspects of museum practice. Um, so as opposed to talking about their collections and talking about um, you know, the histories, uh, they actually focus in on the jobs of individuals within the museum. <clears throat> so one of their uh, more recent episodes was called um, Put All That Virgo Energy Into Spreadsheets. And uh, it's um, it was focused on uh, the work of one of their assistant registrars. Um, and uh, again, it's just sort of, you know, like a nice conversation. They talk about what they do, but it's a bit fun. And you can tell the, you know, their friends and the, and that they get along. So there's lots of different uh, topics that you could cover within a podcast. It doesn't just have to be, you know, entirely informational, entirely about your collections. Um, so, so, you know, definitely worth thinking about if um, podcasting is something you would like to do. Just as we um, come up to the quick five minute break. Here's um, a list of resources for podcasting. So obviously we're gonna have a um, tutorial which will be on our YouTube channel um, 
hopefully next week. Uh, but we've also uh, there's also some really excellent resources out there from the Digital Culture Network. And they've got a really good resource on how to get started with podcasting. Um, something I really recommend reading is uh, Hannah Hethman's Your Museum Needs a Podcast book. I think if you have like an Audible subscription um, or a Kindle subscription, you can get it for free. Uh, but I think otherwise it's maybe like five pounds for, for, a, for, a, for a copy. Um, and if you're you know, serious about creating a podcast, I really recommend getting that book because it's um, a really great sort of you know, whistle stop tour of, of all of the things you need to think about before you start making your podcast. And, and Hannah's very non knowledgeable on it. Um, and there's also another uh, article there from Hannah on um, podcasting in museums. I guess it's sort of like, you know, a condensed version of a book giving you a roundup. Um, so, so yeah, well worth checking out. So next up, we're going to be talking about online events. So um, towards the beginning of uh, lockdown must have been in the april maybe or the may uh we had a talk with strawberry hill house um who were moving uh, looking to move their flower festival uh, which they had planned for the summer they were looking to move it online and um so we talked through some of the different platforms that they could use they'd already sort of decided that zoom was uh, going to be the right platform for them but after discussions, they they chose uh, they they decided that yes, Zoom Zoom was the platform that they wanted to use. So they use Zoom as a way to sort of host a version of the event um, as slightly different to how it would have been in person. But they invited the different florists um, or flower rangers to uh, and gardeners to to deliver talks via Zoom. They use the uh, the platform to to have people, you know, the public join them almost as sem seminars, and uh, the the uh, speakers, you know, talk through their arrangements. Um, they had some video footage and some images that they were sharing through screen sharing, and then at the end there was an opportunity for people to sort of ask questions, and and it worked really well as a um, way of moving the event online. Um, and considering you know, how early on it was, the fact that not many museums were were doing online events at the time, um, I thought it was a really nice example of of how uh, a smaller organisation could, you know, utilise platforms for for creating and delivering online events. Another really nice example um, is uh, the Museum of Cornish Life's uh, "Wish You Were Here" virtual visit tours. Um, so. The way that these have been working is the Museum of Cornish Live sent in a number of tablet devices into care homes. And then on scheduled days, uh, they did a um, sort of personalized, unique uh, tour of the museum. So around a specific exhibition um, or, you know, around all of the galleries and specifically for those uh, residents so that they could all uh, watch it. Um, I thought that was a really nice example, and you can find out more uh, by clicking the link um, about that. Another good example, and again, this is a larger organization, um, but I think it's a good example to, to learn from, is uh, the Tank Museum. So every year they do Tank Fest, uh, which is where they you know, open the organization up and people come and um, look at all the various different tanks and they have loads of different activities around it. And this year they moved it all online. Um, I think maybe via Facebook Live. I can't quite exactly remember the platform that they use. But the thing that I wanted to talk about was that they um, had a partnership with the video game World of Tanks. And this is a really popular free to play video game. And World of Tanks actually created um, some uh, unique tanks that players could download. Um, and uh, they would pay for the, the tank to download and then play in game and all of the money that uh, the, the players, you know, all of the money for downloading the tanks was then given directly to the museum. Um, so I think they, they sort of raised around 80,000 pounds, something like that um, through this endeavor. Um, and uh, they, they also said that uh, through YouTube um, they achieved 5 million views um, for their, festival which is you know far greater than they would have had uh, in person 
and apparently an, a thousand percent increase in online shop sales which is quite uh, impressive obviously this is a larger scale example because uh, the tank museum is quite a large museum um, and they've got quite large teams uh, but it is a really nice example of an organization that knows its unique selling point it's an organization that um, you know understands where its audience is and where its audience isn't but where its audience could potentially be so you know the majority of people who play world of tanks might just like the game um, and maybe are interested in tanks but probably not to the extent of physically going to visit the 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 tank museum um, but they are an audience that would be interested in the idea of preserving tank history um, or they would be an audience that would definitely be keen in downloading a, um, you know, a, a thing that they could use in game that would also support the museum. So, again, it's just a really nice example of a museum that knows its unique selling point. And we've got another example of that a little bit further in when we're talking about fundraising. So um, just to, to round off um, digital events. We've got uh, this example or these examples from the um, Royal College of Physicians, and um, they've been running a series of um, digital museum lates, um, which have loads of different uh, themes. Um, sometimes they're, uh, you know, uh, focus around exhibitions. Sometimes they focus around collections, and they have special guest speakers, and they also have, you know, staff uh, leading the events. Um, the the events of you know pretty well attended and and still are um so so i think these are really nice examples of an event series that potentially you could look at creating you know like a blended approach because these are events that work really well online um but these are also events that when things go back to normal um could work very well uh, in person there are events that you could continue running in your galleries in your spaces um you know, it'd just be the, the method of delivery that, that's changed, not necessarily the, the content. So here are some um, resources uh, for, uh, for those. We've got a um, upcoming live streaming training, um, which will take you through the various different platforms that you can use for live streaming and some of the equipment that you might need. And um, that's being run in January, I think. It's on our website, so you can sign up if you'd like. Um, we've got some top tips for digital marketing, if you're thinking about marketing your events, um, how to make content, online content accessible. And that's an important thing to think about for all of the examples that we're sharing. You know, how are you gonna make sure that this content is ex accessible for everyone? Things like alt text on images, um, captioning your, your YouTube videos or your videos on your website. Um, and again, there's you know lots of resources for that sort of stuff in there, uh, but I'm always happy to talk about it as well if you'd like more information. The how to stream, how to stream through YouTube, uh, which is the one, two, three, four, five, uh, sixth one down here, um, is a really uh, useful uh, tool to use if you're thinking about how you can make your online events a little bit more interactive and a little bit more um, creative, uh, because basically you can use Zoom. So at the moment, I'm just zooming to you as a, as a group of people. Um, but if I wanted to, I could broadcast this Zoom directly to YouTube. Um, so theoretically, I wouldn't need anybody, you know, I wouldn't need you all in the Zoom if I didn't want to. I could just use Zoom as the platform um, or as the almost the recorder. And then I can put it all on YouTube so you could all watch it on YouTube. The benefits to that is that um, I could use things like screen sharing um, so I could show videos and I could show images on my screen uh, with myself up in the corner there and deliver it straight to YouTube for a much larger audience um, than would be practical uh, within Zoom because it's much harder to manage big, large groups of people in Zoom. Um, whereas with YouTube, you've got like the comment feature and people can just sort of dip in and out as they wish. Um, so, so that's a really useful one to think about if you're thinking about sort of larger scale online uh, events. Learning audiences. So I really like this example from um, Brent Museum. Again, this is, uh, this is a museum that we worked with uh, during lockdown. Uh, Brent wanted to uh, create some video content, but they didn't really know where to start. And, and uh, Jana, she um, 
sort of under her own initiative, she used some of our uh, video editing tutorials to learn how to edit videos using a um, camera <clears throat> and a microphone, the platform called HitFilm, uh, which is the, the one that our video editing tutorial is uh, focused on. And she just created these really nice, um, fairly short videos for learning audiences. So this is almost like a recreation of a handling session that they would deliver in school in person. And um, she's made a, a video of which um, they can then send to schools to watch as part of their sort of like learning engagement um, program. It's worth saying that um, Jana had had very little experience with editing videos before when she started. Um, I'm not even sure if she had any experience. Um, but if you watch the videos, you can see that, you know, they're really good quality, really well edited. It's nothing, you know, fancy and, and um, incredibly difficult. It's just really uh, simple and really effective. And, um, and yeah, they're well worth checking out. And, and I think it, it serves as a testament that if you wanted to, these are things that you could, you know, pick up and do fairly easily if you, you know, just have the, the sort of time to invest in them. But again, this is why I go back to that whole thing about um, strategy. You know, is it strategically important for your organization to reach schools? Um, and is digital the best and or only option for you to do that at the moment? If so, something like this um, might be really useful and, and learning that video editing skill um, might be really useful as well. If that's not something that is um, strategically important for your organization, maybe it's not something that you want to um, spend you know, as much time focusing on. It could be something that you could potentially outsource uh, if you can get the funding to do it. Um, you could look at, you know, getting volunteers uh, in to, to help you do that sort of stuff. Um, so, so, you know, what I'm saying is doing it yourself um, isn't always the best option. So you need to think about what's best for uh, your organization as well. So um, uh, some more examples from the Museum of London, um, and they have a very uh, strong learning offer, digital learning offer, something that they've been developing uh, for a number of years. Um, but it's something that you can you know, learn from as well. They've been doing uh, live streaming uh, sessions. They've, they've done them for a few years, but they've now moved um, for, for their sort of school engagements program. The majority of their stuff is online now. And they have um, a Bronze Age Mystery Uncovered a live stream that schools can sort of like register for and they will deliver live for those schools. And um, so it has curator talks and video content that they pull in and Q and A's and all sorts. They're, they're really great. And um, you can find recordings of them on uh, YouTube. So if you follow that link, you'll be able to, to find all of those as resources and, um, and, and check them out. And then uh, next up, we've got Reba. And um, at the very beginning of lockdown, Reba um, spent a bit of time as a team creating some really effective digital learning resources that people could do at home. And um, there's just a really nice example of uh, a team that sort of like pulled together and, and worked really hard to, to create um, these, these resources that, that people could just sort of download and, and, and do as they wish. Um, you know, well worth checking out and um, having a look at the, the stuff that they've created and how they package it and, and how they market it to, to different audiences. This I really like from um, Hastings Museum and Art Gallery. Uh, they, during lockdown, were doing regular Lego live streams. Um, so they were encouraging um, kids to, to use Lego and build um, uh, stuff that they're inspired by some of it was through their own collections and other stuff, you know, was through um, various different websites or historical objects. And, um, and basically they did like a step-by-step. -step. So this is the thing that we're going to recreate and this is how we're going to do it. And then they did like a live stream uh, of them making it so that people could, you know, build along with them. And I thought that was a really nice idea of, of um, using platforms and, and tools that are readily available to, to do something quite interesting and something a bit different. Here we've got all of the resources for um, engaging learning audiences um, from an introduction to uh, introductory guide to online learning techniques, which is really interesting from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. 
uh, to Gems Resource Bank, which is absolutely huge and has tons of great resources. Um, we've got uh, this digital on a shoestring by Izzy Bartley. Um, is really good it has a specific learning focus and Izzy has been um, doing sort of like digital learning for for quite a while and and she's she's really great at what she does and uh, her article on digital on a shoestring is um, really helpful for organizations that have a very small budget but want to do some interesting digital stuff with learning so I very much uh, recommend checking that out next up we have fundraising so these are just some examples of uh, museums that have engaged their audiences uh, through fundraising activities. And there's been a lot of examples from the sector, so I'm not gonna talk through you know, all of them, but I'm gonna pick out a few of the different ones and just sort of like highlight why, why they're quite interesting. So again, the RAF Museum, large organization, um, but doesn't mean that you can't uh, learn from it. This adopt a piece of RAF history I thought was really interesting. They did like an adopt an artifact um, program, very similar to how like zoos and um, charities for like guide dogs um, do adopt a puppy or adopt an animal. And um, they did one for uh, adopt a um, piece of RAF history. So, you know, it's just a, it's a more interesting way of um, getting people to donate. Um, they're sort of donating into a to a package and an idea as opposed to just you know giving money um straight through various different crowdfunding platforms and um, so again you know check that link out i think it's a really interesting idea and definitely something that you could you know think through about how you could potentially utilize that for your audience particularly if you have a very specific audience and um, so when i was at the museum of the Aurora st john um, our core audience was current and past St. John ambulance volunteers. So, you know, if I was thinking about doing something similar, I would probably package it and aim it directly at SJA volunteers, you know, like adopt a piece of your history or, you know, however you wanted to, to, um, to, to phrase it. But I think that's a quite a nice idea to, to get some inspiration from. Next up, we've got the National Video Game Museum. And this is going back to the um, Tank Museum example that I was talking about. The uh, National Video Game Museum, they did a really successful fundraiser. And the main reason that it was so successful is because they managed to get their fundraiser in front of people who um, aren't normally their, you know, sort of visitor audience. So this, um, the, the campaign was picked up by um, video game websites like Eurogamer and Kotaku, which are really large um, video game websites where people who are interested in uh, video games, you know, go to, to read about and watch videos about the games that they like. And so the, those individuals would probably not visit the National Video Game Museum. Um, but they would be interested in the idea of uh, donating to help preserve the history of video games. And so for a lot of these uh, individuals, they probably wouldn't have heard of the museum before or necessarily really understood what they did. Um, but they could you know, identify and connect with the idea of preserving the history of something that they really enjoyed and something that they were quite passionate about. Um, so, so that was a really good way of reaching an audience which is related, but not quite the same as, as their usual funders and donors. Again, there's a link there so you can uh, check out the fundraiser. And then last but not least for fundraising, we've got um, this really nice example from um, Charleston. I think it's a historic house and they use the Art Fund um, Art Happens platform. And the reason that I like this example is because as part of the fundraiser, they had um, like packages that people could pay for to um, sort of various different donation levels. So when you donate X amount, uh, you'd get like maybe a tote bag um, and it goes all the way up to a few thousand pounds where you could um, donate uh, let's say a thousand pounds and you get a private tour with um, the author Virginia Nicholson um, around the site you know when it was possible uh, you could donate and get photo shoots and and that sort of stuff so a lot of that um, a lot of those sort of like tier packages would have done uh, would have been organized almost like a donation from the individual so Virginia Nicholson probably wouldn't be paying for her time but she sort of donated her time to the museum so that somebody might donate to the museum 
you know, f- for that experience. And um, so I thought that was quite a nice way of um, using different packages and different options to to get different people interested in donating. And it, it also gives the the donor the feeling that they're getting something special from their donation, um, other than just, you know, the feeling of, of supporting the organization. Um, and it can also help to tempt individuals who, who might not otherwise donate or who might not have otherwise been aware of the organization um, to sort of feel compelled to, to donate because they're getting that sort of like extra, the special thing that they might not have otherwise. So here we've got some um, links uh, for the various different fundraising platforms. Um, Art Funds fundraising platform, that's Art Happens. The Museums Association has recently done a partnership with Crowdfunder. So if you're a um, institutional member, if your museum is an in- institutional member, uh, you can launch a Crowdfunder campaign um, for free. So the Crowdfunder won't take a cut of any of the donations that you receive um, as they would usually. We've got some introductions to um, box office ticketing and um, customer relationship management tools um, because it's important to know, you know, who your audience is and who your visitors are and who your potential donors are. And um, particularly CRM tools are a really good way of um, keeping on on top of, of, you know, your donors and the messaging around your donors and um, like marketing, email marketing campaigns, that sort of stuff. There's also some really good um, courses, free courses here from um, FutureLearn, Effective Fundraising and Leadership in Arts and Culture, um, <clears throat> and uh, a practical guide to lawful fundraising from arts, fundraising and philanthropy is really useful, um, you know, just to be aware of, of the law and, and what you can and can't uh, do when it comes to, to fundraising. So we're going to finish off now with um, some examples of some immersive technologies or experiences. Um, Again, you know, the caveat that these are predominantly from larger organizations. But just because uh, there are examples from large organizations doesn't mean that you can't apply for grants, say with like um, Arts Council, uh, the project grants, um, to, to do these sorts of activities within your organization if you feel that they are relevant um, and um, you know, hit that sort of strategic need. So this I'm going to be really interested to find out more about um, is potentially one of the first ever museum um, virtual reality events. So in uh, March 2021, the V&A are going to do a virtual reality experience, and um, which is an event that people can book tickets for and then um, you know, experience through their own virtual reality headsets. The one thing that I will say about this sort of stuff is, is really interesting and I'm sure it'll be absolutely excellent. But the take up of virtual reality isn't huge. So you know, you're already sort of limiting your audience to individuals who uh, you know, would potentially do an experience. And then you're limiting it again to the individuals who have a virtual reality headset. That saying, that being said, um, you know, there are lots of individuals who, you know, might have virtual reality and look for these sorts of events. So you would be engaging in your audience. And there may also be individuals who um, use virtual reality and also aren't, you know, are either vulnerable or unconfident about, you know, going to events where there could be lots of people um, due to the current uh, climate. So this sort of experience could be really well suited for, for those sorts of people who you might not be able to engage with otherwise. Another virtual reality example, um, and this one the uh, is a virtual reality experience of the boarding of the Mayflower, um, which I thought was quite interesting. Again, this is a large project that would require funding, um, but these sorts of immersive experiences, maybe not virtual reality, but things like augmented reality and mixed reality, as the technology advances, they will become um, more realistic and more affordable, um, similar to how, you know, the idea of uh, making a video for your museum uh, 20 years ago, or so would have been an expensive endeavor. Now with smartphones and tablets, and you know, you can you can make that sort of content quite easily.
the same will happen eventually for the more immersive technologies as the technology gets better. Um, so, so, you know, these are the sorts of things that you want to look out for at the moment, just to see how people are using the platforms and to maybe sort of develop ideas of how you could potentially use the platforms, um, either for potential funding bids um, or for uh, some point in the future um, when these technologies become more accessible um, and uh, more accessible in budget and, you know, more accessible through through the technologies that you use um, so that you could create something yourself. But this is quite a nice example of an immersive experience. Um, it was for the uh, 400th um, anniversary of uh, the Mayflower uh, sort of sailing and boarding. And um, yeah, it's just quite a nice virtual reality experience. I think they've done a really good uh, job of recreating what it would have felt like you know, what the place would have looked like, um, the sort of atmosphere uh, of it all. And these are things that, you know, you might be interested in, particularly if your, you know, your site lends itself to those sorts of things. Um, your site lends itself to virtual reality, augmented reality, those sorts of experiences. It's not, you know, relevant for everyone because not everyone is in that type of organization. But for those that are, this uh, might be interesting. Okay, and here we go. A final page of resources. We've got some um, different resources here that we've created, uh, how to create digital 3D models. And that's a tutorial that uh, we've put together and is on our YouTube. And um, the museum's immersive network is something that's really recently been set up. And it might be something that um, if you're thinking about immersive experiences for your organization, uh, that could be a really good network to, to join or to find out a little bit more about just because um, it's you know very much in its infancy and I think a lot of it is about talking about how organizations can use these experiences and what are the potentials and what are the drawbacks so um, so if it is something you're interested in definitely check out that network I think they've got their first network meeting in January um, so so it might be something worth signing up to and then um, I've just got a few uh, lists here of some different immersive museum experiences things that you might want to to check out and find out about um if that's something that interests you so again um going back to my very first slide on uh, strategy you know all of these examples are really nice examples of of different ways to engage audiences and create content um but but the most important thing is to you know think about it within the context of your organization and that context could be the resources that you have available. So, you know, the time you have, uh, your budget, and the context could be the types of audiences that you're looking to engage, and whether they're, you know, younger or older or a completely different demographic. And, um, you know, thinking about the types of content you're creating and whether or not it's actually hitting that target audience. Um, and thinking about the best platform for the activities that you're thinking of doing. Um, you know, we've seen, for instance, like the Egham uh, Museum example of that uh, interactive story Twitter thread. There's lots of interesting and creative things that you can do with these different platforms. It's just about thinking a little bit outside of the box and, and thinking about how you can potentially use them um, and, and deciding which platform is best for you. So if you don't have a strong Twitter following, um, but you do get lots of visits to your website, um, you might want to create the interactive story on Twine, for instance, as opposed to Twitter. And then you could you know, share the link on your website for people to play. So there's lots of different uh, options and ideas for how you can create this type of content. It's just you, you need to make sure that you're thinking strategically um, about the stuff that you're doing, particularly at the moment as um, budgets get, are getting tighter and as uh, time is getting you know, more precious. You need to be, you know, very clear and focus about what you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it, and you know who you're trying to do it for. So those are my examples from uh, the sector. Quite a few different uh, examples there, ranging from you know big budgets to smaller budgets, um, organisations in and outside of London. So hopefully you've uh, found them interesting and that you've uh, found them slightly, you know, inspirational for the for the work that you're doing. Again, I'm going to share all of those slides so you can click on them and find out more uh, via the slides. And we've got all of those resources as well. If you want to read up more about you know, specific activities or if you want to look at some tutorials about how you could potentially do it yourself.